It is my great pleasure to introduce our, our basically our first keynote speaker today. Uh, Theo lives very, very close to me, and it was really, really funny because yesterday he came up and said, here it is, we had to fly all the way across country just to meet each other, okay? You'll find that kind of common in a lot of, you know, ASF projects. People will know the names, not so much the faces, and even when you're talking to each other, you don't get the opportunity, unfortunately, to... Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, you want to use mine? Oh, uh, sure. Okay. Developers, not presenters. I feel like I present more than I write. <laughs> so, everyone, I'd like to welcome uh, Theo Sloshnagel. He will be talking to us uh, for the next 45 minutes or so. Will you be trying to uh, try set to time for a Q&A at the very, very end? Sure. Okay. So, if there are questions, uh, try to hold them off. Um, do well. Okay. We're going to go and switch the. Uh, the microphone real quick. There we go. Does it okay. Work? All set. All right. All righty. I have to accept the wireless internet connection agreement. Hold on. Uh, there we go. PatchCon NA. All right, so hi. Welcome to PatchCon. Um, I've been involved with the ASF since, I guess, 2000. Um, I've talked at a lot of Apache Cons on, on topics, uh, usually re re revolving around scalable systems design. Um, that's what I do. Um, and make things grow really big. Um, a lot of that has to do with performance. Some of it has to do with scalability. Um, amazingly, almost all of it has to do with Apache. Um, so I, a lot of you may have seen me before, but I look different, so we'll do a little intro slide of the various, various issues that I have. Um, these pictures are all taken in a single 12-month time span. Um, and I have, you know, my different different type of, you know, moods that go with that. Um, do not try to fly on airplanes in the last one. It did not work well. <laughs> I remember Barcelona not so fondly. Um, so uh, scalable system design. Uh, since that's what I do, that's what I know, um, you'd ask yourself, you know, what the hell does that have to do with ASF? Um, it turns out that as long as you're building software that gets deployed everywhere, um, there are people that are running it at scale. There are people pushing the envelope with your software. Some of the software at the ASF, you really, really see that with, right? I mean, HTTPD seems like a pretty good example of uh, a piece of software, a piece of technology that people have used and abused and, and made a fortune off of, right? I mean, it, it really powers basically all delivery of everything they do on the internet. And there's a lot of newcomers as well. I mean, there's, there's the Nginxes of the world and all the other web servers that are out there. Um, but Apache still has a, a, a pretty significant market footprint. Um, and the reason for that is because, as Jim said, um, the people that needed to build a web server, they needed to build it because their livelihoods depended on it. Right? They actually had a job to do that they could not do without building a piece of software. So, I, I ha I'm a very, very pragmatic person. I don't like to solve problems that don't exist. Um, I don't like to code for the sake of coding. I like to code for the sake of solving something that's real that affects usually my life, um, uh, that ends up affecting other people's lives as well. So if you look at all of the projects in the ASF, the ones that go out and actually make individual people's lives better are the ones that are vibrant and successful, obviously. It's a kind of self-reinforcing -re cycle because the community builds around that, right? If a product makes your life better, you participate in the community. That's how it works. Um, so there's a lot of technology. Apache has a lot of this technology. Um, and a lot of it is really awesome, right? There's a lot of technology that's not at the ASF that's really awesome. Um, there's, there's, there's FreeBSD, there's Linux, there's, uh, there's Illumos, there's MySQL, there's Postgres, none of which are at the ASF. Pretty awesome technologies. Um, 
when you look across the SF, we've got some great stuff. And then I come to the pragmatic nature of things. Um, we have a problem in our industry that things are so awesome um, that we tend to lose ourselves <laughs> in the technology, right? And we forget what the real world looks like. We come in and we try to find the perfect solution to our problem. Um, so one of the slides that, that, that Jim threw up, threw up was really great is community created code, which is really what we have. The infrastructure, the architecture, the organizational structure of Apache really prevents anything else, right? So you can't not have community created code at Apache. That's, that one's easy because Apache did all of the work to create a structure that, that, that only produces that. Um, the other thing was codes that, that is exceptional. And I challenge you all to redefine what you think exceptional is. Exceptional is not code that's beautiful. It's code that works. One of my colleagues wrote a, 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 a blog article, uh, one of my favorite articles on our site, which is, your code may be elegant, but mine fucking works. Um, <laughs> and it's a really good article that discusses real world issues around writing code, is that you do it to solve a problem, that problem solving it tomorrow is not useful if you need to solve it today. So there are timelines, there are real situations. The, the technological world out there, right, is an ugly world. The, the, the HTTP spec is a great example of, if you wrote an, a web server that adhered to the spec, no one would be able to talk to it, right? It has to be incredibly flexible, it has to comply with the spec, but all of the shoulds it does, right? It's be very tolerant on what you accept and very rigorous on what you give. Right? So the idea of building software that actually interoperates and actually works is much more important than solving the problem the right way. Because in the end of the day, it's not right. So um, there's a huge step that we all have to take as we grow as engineers and software developers um, that gets this idea out of our head that code is our baby. Right? If I call your baby ugly, you can punch me in the face. If I call your code ugly, it's code. Right? If your code is broken, it's broken. Uh, you have no loyalty to your code. It's just instructions for a computer. You can give it a different set. You can give it a different set of instructions in a different language. Right? That is not your baby. Um, and one of the things that I see, uh, and we see this at our company, and we see this all around, is that people take so much pride in the work that they do that they confuse the work product that they have with their own personal identity. All right, dumping your soul into a project and creating something doesn't mean that it is your soul. Right? You, you, you can't crush it that way. Take that feedback, make it constructive. Try to make it constructive. Um, but even when you have destructive feedback, take it as criticism. Right? Just look at the code, reflect on the code, and say, yeah, maybe that does suck. How could I do it better? Right? How do I do this differently? What real world problem am I not solving? So um, I recommend you to not be loyal at all to code, right? Be, be loyal to the problems you're trying to solve instead. So we as engineers tend to focus on the technologies we love as opposed to the ones that, that actually solve the problems better, right? So fall in love with the problems you're trying to solve, not with the technologies you use to solve them, right? So we see a prevalence of Java in the ASF. There's a huge amount of projects in Java. Um, nothing wrong with Java. Um, but the idea of building them in the Java, because Java is what you know, um, is incredibly limiting to the way you build product. It infuses a product with a mentality around Java. And it's not that there's a problem with Java, it's that it's a single frame of mind. So if you involve something like Scala and, and Clojure, I mean, they actually all even run on the JVM, but you have this mentality of functional programming, this mentality of, of, of Lisp-like languages, right? And all of these things come in and they change the way you think about problems and you become more creative about your problem, problem solving. So awkward honesty is Apache projects suffer from this. We suffer very badly from this. We're very insular. So all the projects that we have, while we have an incredibly good structure to develop these projects, the project communities tend to be very insular. Um, so I'd love everybody to think about, we have the best forum in the world for solving this because we have so many people together in one place to talk, right? So we can use ApacheCon as an opportunity to stretch our communities, our individual project communities in weird ways that make them much better. So, it may sound like I'm saying specialization is evil. I would say that specialization is not an evil thing, um, 
But if it doesn't have a strong balance in your project, it leads to awkward situations. For example, a love affair with a hammer, right? So there are a lot of products out there that look like this. And I'm sure that board is not gonna come out. That's great. Um, and I'm really not a fan of perfect being the enemy of the good, but that's kind of just crappy, right? So um, this is an irrational love affair with a ha hammer. Right? Just because you know how to use a hammer doesn't mean you shouldn't figure out how to use a screwdriver every once in a while. And we see this in the scalable world as an addiction to specific languages and frameworks. Um, frameworks in general, they're designed to solve a person's problem and that community forms around it and guides that project and they solve a very particular use case for a problem. And as you apply that to a highly scalable environment, um, you start to really see the glaring differences of that person's problem and yours. Right? So they don't map one to one. There are rough edges where you don't have full coverage and those rough edges, they, they're, you know, they're like a million lumen light bulb blinding you. So your job is really to tell a computer what to do. Right? It's distilled to that. As a software engineer, you are giving instructions to a computer. So all of these ideas, if you're a functional programmer and you're thinking about monads, that's great. But at the end of the day, like your stuff runs today, at least, in assembly. That's, that's the way it runs. It runs in machine code. Your JVM helps you get there, or, or your compiler helps you get there, or your interpreter if you're running Python or Perl. Uh, but at the end of the day, that's what's happening. Right? And don't lose touch with that, because at the end of the day, anyone can get the computer to do similar things. Um, so our, our challenges are really big. Um, and, and the reason is because you don't, as software engineers, control who runs your product where. So HTPD would be a very different project today if uh, it only ran like personal websites that get 100 hits a, a month. It would be a very, very different project, but that's not the case. It happens to do with the way the project was founded and who was using it, um, but there are other projects. For example, uh, ATS, which I, I, I participate in, uh, the Apache traffic server, um, that serves a lot of traffic. Uh, I would argue it serves more traffic than it did when it was released. Um, uh, Yahoo released that originally, and, and there are some, some sites in China that push some pretty insane workloads through that product, and the things that they find out about that are really exciting and really healthy for the community. And they also make us look at our code and realize that, man, it's a pile of shit, right? So you're looking at it and, and, and there's, you know, pride will only take you, uh, take you, you know, pride is a good thing, but, but at some point you just need to say, okay, we have a real world problem and we have a solution that's not meeting it. How do we get there? Let's for, forget about perfect. So it's about compromise. It's about making products that really work. Um, because somebody's business does depend on it. So with the growing scale and performance demands in all of these companies, you have companies that are running hundreds of thousands of servers in each data center that they have, or two or three hundred thousands of servers, um, and they're running ASF code on there. They're running Cassandra, they're running Hadoop, they're running HTTPD, they're running ATS, they're running all of the Java libraries, all the, I mean, half the stuff that you install that's Java is based on commons, right? So. That's all there, and it's all being exercised, um, likely in an environment that you have never seen before and probably can't even fathom. So trying to figure out how to get those people into your community to, to feedback how you can change the problems you're trying to solve is a really good thing. Um, to give some perspective on this, we did a little survey of our customers, and we took None of the, we, we have a whole bunch of customers that are in the Alexa Top 100. Um, so we eliminated all of those, and we eliminated all the customers that have less than a million users. Um, and we took a, kind of a swath over the middle, our, our middle tier customers, and we, we did some, some math and some averages. And it turns out that a normal medium site, in this case, they have about 50 million users on, on average. They end up having about 30 different repos internally, not open source, 30 different repos. Uh, they're teams that work on, right? So they've got your, you know, your web front end, some of your back end middleware, some of your finance, some of your BI, some of this, that, and the other, right? And it ends up, you look at it, you're like, shit, we have 30 repos. Um, six different programming languages represented. So the idea is that I run Java because I know Java. It's one of six, most likely in a medium-sized company. So if you had chose one of the other five, you would not have actually shaken anyone's tree, right? So um, the, the idea of making these things interoperate is really, really important. Um, and uh, what's really exciting is that we see, on average, 30 putbacks 
into open source projects. Not all to the ASF, but a good number to the ASF, uh, just because they have so much infrastructure there. Um, but we see putbacks into, into Postgres, into Cassandra, into, into MySQL. Not so much MySQL anymore. I think Oracle did something. Um, but we, we, have, we have this, and that really tells me that the Apache model, this idea that people could make a livelihood off of it, it's not GPL, not to get into a, into a license war, but the, just the mentality of the Apache software license, it really works. It really encourages participation. And across all of the, 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 the companies that we work with, we have some companies that are really not open source companies. <laughs> And they are absolutely fine with every bug fix going right back to the community. So it, it really makes sense um, to companies. Uh, three different operating systems, three different server vendors, two different networking vendors, and four different database technologies. And the first one, I think, is the, the kind of the weirdest. Because back in the day, when I did this, you know, I started out 15, almost 20 years ago, um, it, it, it was one, right? You, you, you ran MySQL, or you ran Oracle, and you figured out how to do everything with that database. And it sort of looked like a, a, a piece of wood with a screw bent and a hammer next to it. Um, but people are really embracing this idea of, let me use the right tool for the job. And the interesting part of all of this is that it ends up being provided by a really big team, um, sometimes by a small team. But these teams are made up of smaller teams. Right? So you have this large community, given a, a company that's got maybe two or 300 engineers, Nobody has a two or 300 member team, right? You have a seven member team or five member team, sometimes a two member team. That looks a whole lot like the ASF, right? You've got this enormous community of people that are like-minded on how they want to develop software and everybody's got these little groups. So it looks a lot alike. Um, and these people are addicted to the technologies that they know. If I go and I was in the hackathon yesterday and I can see these tables and it's all talking about Java or it's all talking about HTTP or and that's, that's, you know, they're just talking about they're in their zone. And that's a really great thing. Um, but yet again, if that's, only, that's the only thing that happens, there are a lot of products that look, again, like an addiction with a hammer and an all too common result of irrational love of a single product. Um, so stretching that community and making it um, more diverse in, in who participates. And I'll get to who I think really needs to be in that. It's not really cross-pollination between the, the, the communities as much. But this leads to really unhappy customers, is the, is the truth, right? The reason that our products at the ASF are successful is because people use them to deliver value to other people, right? We build infrastructure products. Um, occasionally, there's a developer product, right? There's a product that's really designed to deliver value directly to the person who uses it. But almost all of the products are leveraged in a way where someone takes the product and delivers value to yet another person. So you, they are, all of the real value generation of the products being run is, is a second derivative. Um, and we have to be focusing on that end user experience. That's, that's where that value is. That's where you change lives. That's where the world gets better. And the interesting part is that unless you're that person serving that traffic to that end user, your perspective isn't good enough. So technological complexity is evil, right? Everybody says, it's an old rule, keep it simple, stupid. Right? Everything should be as simple as possible. This is a rule. Don't, don't ever violate this rule, please. I've looked at some projects, and it's like, oh my god, oh my god. Um, however, in our current systems at scale, technological complexity is an emergent behavior of the business requirements that drive them. Our businesses are changing quickly. We're adding new features and functionality, not to software, but to business offerings. Oops. All right. Did it cut out? Yep. OK. Um, oh, it's back. OK, good. All right. Um, so it's, it's an emergent behavior of, of, of the way businesses run. Um, and if you don't think that your business runs that way, then just wait, and it'll probably go out of business, and you'll hire somewhere else. Um, but the way we deliver on the internet today um, is incredibly uh, hostily competitive. Right. So this is going to happen. That complexity, uh, one of my, one of my uh, friends, uh, Brian Cantrell, he described this, um, this aquarium, this emergent behaviors of failure. So, went to an aquarium and the sharks kept dying, right? Like, 
sharks don't have predators, really. I mean, they, they just really don't have predators, especially in an aquarium. Right? It's like, I mean, everybody's puzzled. You know, you're looking, and all the all the uh, the biologists are there, and they're like, I don't know what the hell's happening. Like this, every I come in at night, every week we have like a shark that's just dead and floating in in the aquarium. Like, what's going on? So they set up cameras, and they're looking at it, and completely unexpectedly, this octopus would get pissed off and strangle a shark. And it's like, why would you? Why would you do? You don't eat it, right? I mean, it was just like I don't know. It was ornery, right? So it was this really weird behavior, and, and he likes to, to, to say that uh, you know, when things go wrong, it's like, it's a fucking octopus, man, just came up whoosh, out of nowhere. And a lot of times, that's, that, that's what technical debt looks like. You know? You're going along, and then suddenly you realize, oh, that mistake, that's, now, now I feel it. Right? That's the wound. Um, and complexity works exactly that way. So as your systems become highly decoupled, you're running four different database technologies in six different languages, and they're all talking to each other. That complexity, um, it exists because your velocity to deliver business solutions would be too small. It would, it would be too slow um, to compete without them. So uh, relative correctness, just a real quick detour on, on relative correctness. We worked with a company that um, uh, sold stuff online. So I'm probably sure you've heard of companies that sell things online. It's really popular. Um, they sold a lot of different things. Uh, there were, it was kind of an auction site sort of thing, where, so where as a user of the site, I can upload my goods for sale. Um, so when I go to the front page of the site, they're promoting new items. They always want to see the newest items. You know, what are the newest upload is the most popular. Right, so they had been dumping this stuff into a technology that uses Lucene underneath. And, um, and they were looking at it. And there were two things that happened here. One, the Lucene search engine. Um, was not quite fast enough. And they were looking at the graphs, and it was like, oh, you know, it's doing, it's, you know, doing, was it uh, 800 IOPS a second on, on the box? And this was before the time of SSDs. Um, and we're looking at it, we're like, okay, well, they're like, it's, it's taxed, we need to grow the cluster, we need to buy like 16 more machines, we only have four, just bump it up to 20, we'll be set. And we're looking at it, I'm like, okay, how, how much data do you have? And they're like, well, the Lucene index is 18 gigs. I'm like, okay, well, how much RAM do you have? And they're like, well, we have 16 gigs. I'm like, okay, well, you know if you had 32, it would all fed first, and you'd never hit disk, so it wouldn't be a problem. Not an infinitely scalable solution, clearly, but that'll work. But 800 IOPS, like what kind of boxes are those? And they're like, oh, they just have two drives in them. Like, what kind of drives can you get that will give you 800 IOPS? And they're like, well, I mean, that's what the system says. I'm like, that's not what physics says, dude, right? That's not how that works. Like, they're, they're not that fast. You can't buy drives like that. And they look at it, and they're looking at the graph. And I'm like, it says 800M, dude, 800 milli IOPS a second, right? So there was a misread there, but there was this, like, detachment from the full stack of the system, right? The, the person running the, 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 the Lucene code there, the person responsible for search indexing, they're looking at this problem, and they're not accepting of the fact that computers, how do they work, right? You've got all this stack. Everything you do runs on a computer. It runs on storage. It runs on spinning disks. It runs on SSDs. They all have parameters, right? And everything that you solve has to fit within those parameters. Or the big red flag of bullshit comes up and goes, hey, there's something wrong. Um, and keeping that in mind is really important. So, the funny irony is that, you know, so the search index guy, as soon as he was, you know, reminded how computers work, he's like, oh, yeah, look at that. We're not taxed. Um, still not fast enough, right? So maybe it's not an IOPS issue, but we don't have the latency is too high. Our throughput's too low. We have to serve this search query on every homepage load. It's like, okay, well, why? why? Well, you know, it has to be up to date. It has to be the most recent data. Now, if anybody's ever worked in distributed systems, you realize there is no most recent data, there is no truth, right? Nothing is ever correct. Um, so what do you mean it has to be current? Like, well, if someone uploads the, the, you know, the, the thing to the site, like, they need to be able to see their own stuff. I'm like, well, first it only needs to be correct for the person who made the change. But, but how correct does it need to be? I said, well, we talked to the business and we said, we want to cache it, we want it to be out of date. And if it's out of date, we can save you a lot of money. And I was like, okay, well, did you define out of date? And they're like, well, not current. I'm like, well, everything's not current. We're going in loops. So went into the business and said, if I can serve that page one second old, 
I can take your 20 servers, instead of going to 100, I can go to two. And they said, one second is now. And, and then you like this light bulb, right? So you have this issue where, as technical people, we think in gigahertz and nanoseconds, and business people think in days or hours or minutes, very rarely seconds. Um, so this idea of things being old, they're like, five minutes is not old, right? And then you're, you're thinking about caches. You put ATS in front of it, and now you can do 300,000 requests a second, and you know, it's like, done. Next problem, right? So we didn't even solve it. We just removed the problem. So, and that has to do with people building technologies and trying to solve problems without going to the people with those problems to better understand them, right? So as a community that's developing your product, the engagement with your community is not just to get bug reports, right? It's to understand what, what is your motivation? Like, why are you using this? What are you doing with it? What are the problems that you still have? How does it hurt when you use this product? Um, and you can build pretty exceptional products. It's called engineering by a pain. It's a good thing. So this technological complexity has to be accepted and it has to be understood and managed. And the companies that do this are the companies that really have good technical competitive advantage. Um, and this is extremely difficult for specialists to handle. So that's, that's the problem with being over-specialized, is that it's very difficult to deal with technological complexity. Um, I gave a talk uh, last year at Surge, and uh, the closing plenary, I talked about this horrible production problem, which I won't go into here, because I don't want to turn into a therapy session. But, it was like a three day long troubleshooting event where I was in the C compiler, I had to debug CPP because um, somebody decided it would be funny to put UTF-8 comments in the Perl source code and it stopped compiling for us um, with a compiler upgrade. And uh, it all had to do with an SSH library that wasn't working right and OpenSSL needed to be upgraded which changed its APIs. So like basically it was the one thread that you pulled and the whole you know, uh, uh, blanket just came apart. Um, and it was all three days of trying to put it back together. It involved uh, uh, hardware NIC bugs with checksumming errors because um, we couldn't publish the fixes because the, the, the box couldn't send it. And the interesting part of that was that it took three days because we had two people that didn't care about boundaries and technology. They were looking at a C problem in libssh2 and then they had an open SSL upgrade, which didn't go well, because then it required a Perl upgrade, which had a problem with CPP. And they didn't have to say, let me JIRA assign that to another team that cares. They didn't isolate themselves, right? So they were able to cross those boundaries. They were able to dive into the kernel. They were able to dive into the you know, to Java code, to C code, um, to libraries, to linkages. All of that stuff they were able to do. And it took what at, at, at a, a big company, if you look at I don't want to name any companies, but there are a lot of large uh, firms that don't make a tremendous amount of money but have a lot of technology. Think Global 2000 that's not finance. And they have these huge stacks. That is a 12-week project because I need to upgrade to SSH2. Oh, open a cell, and that's the security team. Security team does that. Oh, we have a compiler issue. Hands that to the compiler team or tools team. Hands it back, hands it back, hands it back. Somebody's on vacation, another week delay. That's a 12 week process. And you have a com competitor that can do it in three days. You have, you have really good things happen. So that's the value of generalists. Apache, this is actually the first picture that is Apache. It's the Kuhn user group, I think. Yes. Um, uh, so we have these isolated groups. And they really love the technologies that they have. And they would like to solve the problems that they understand. Um, the interesting thing is that we, this is not, I couldn't find a picture, so sorry. This is not the uh, uh, Apache, this is a desktop conference. But we have a lot of people like that. We do have pictures from ApacheCon, I couldn't find them. Um, so we have a huge group of people with an incredibly uh, diverse set of knowledge. So the inconvenient truth of things is that process is required. A lot of people really don't like that. I see a lot of issues on internal mailing lists and the ASF, uh, you know, your process, you're in my way. Ugh. Um, process is really, really important. Anybody who denies that they have process just refuses to write down what they do, right? So process is critically, critically important. Um, and we have it here at the ASF. And I feel like we have just enough. 
which is a good thing. So as much fighting as happens, I think that the process is really fine-tuned to the right amount, that it can get out of your way and still let you work within a structure that can help you. Um, but we do have strong isolations. And awkward honesty, ASX is highly dysfunctional. Um, but I would say that any really positive high velocity relationship is dysfunctional. Those tensions between all these different groups are the unfortunate way we learn from each other. Right? So when infrastructure has issues delivering something for security reasons, you just got educated on why there are security issues with that sort of thing. Um, so, so the way that the ASF works might look dysfunctional, but having seen a lot of organizations, both commercial and nonprofit, um, I think the ASF's dysfunction is not higher than the others, and it's much, much more productive, which is exciting. So on the scalability side, specialists don't live on the high scale edge of applied computing. You can't do it. It doesn't work. When you're out there and you're running software that serves 300,000 requests a second or has 2 million connected users to a single box, you are pushing on technology in ways that your software uh, is not solely responsible for. You're going through a very, very deep stack of shit. And it's all the way down, right? All the way to the firmware. Firmware is always buggy. The hardware is buggy. On top of that, you have an OS that's horribly buggy. Um, if you're lucky, you can at least get kernel panics and core dumps from it, right? And then you go above that and you, you, your JVM, I don't know how many people have their JVM seg fault at least once a day, but we have, we have seg faults just popping all the time in production on JVMs, right? So like as awesome as the JVM is, it just fucking doesn't work, right? And that's a reality that we have to work through. And understanding that whole stack I like to think of technology as this big layered cake, right? You've got your hardware, you've got your firmware, you've got your OS, you've got your apps, you've got your networking, your APIs, your protocols, um, all of that beautiful thing. It's really beautiful, and we tend to live in our little layers. But when you go to the edge and you start pushing on things in a highly scalable way, that layer cake gets squished, and all the layers mix together. Um, and it really doesn't pay off to, to, to refuse to live in the others, right? You have to acknowledge they exist. So um, we've had some really bad ATS stories. Oh, man, horrible product, don't use that. Um, so so we, we run that, and uh, we have these weird issues with malloc, um, and uh, I'm going to the malloc issues. They're kind of traumatizing. So the, the IP issues, we run ATS, and it's, it's interesting that we run our ATS instances, some of the bigger ones, on an operating system called Illumos, which is uh, the you know, forgotten child of the Open Solaris world after Oracle killed it. Um, so Oracle took Open Solaris and decided that Solaris 11 would be closed sourced after they had opened it. It's the second project in the history that, uh, that, that that's happened to. Um, very, very sad. Uh, the beauty is, is that the Open Solaris project uh, was in the state where it could be forked. It was open enough that you could fork it and move on. Uh, the Illumos Foundation, uh, I think they're a foundation now, or they're in the process of becoming one, forked that. There's a whole bunch of operating systems, about six or seven operating systems that are built off of Illumos, kind of like Linux. Um, really interesting problem that it turns out that when you run on the edge, you push on things that other people don't. So our ATS instances, they peak at not even that high, maybe 15,000 requests a second on a single box. Um, but it's incredibly diverse content. So we have IP addresses coming from everywhere in the world, all over mobile. So in a given day, we will see somewhere between 30 and 60 million unique IP addresses coming to these systems. And it turns out that deep in the kernel, there is a cache that stores path into you. So when you make a TCP connection and your MTU is smaller than what you thought, you do this thing called path MTU discovery, and then you say, oh, your MTU is not 1500, it's 1440 or 1420 or 1460 or what have you. And then you have to remember that because you don't want to have to do all that process again, and there's a cache for it. And the cache, we found out, is a 256 bucket cache, which means that when you put 60 million elements in a 256 bucket ca cache, you have very, very long lists in each bucket. And uh, we were seeing a TCP connection come in, and it would take four and a half seconds to complete, where the kernel would do nothing but go find to see if it seen that IP address before and figure out what its path into you was. Um, so this idea that I work in ATS and I can make ATS high performance, 
is a very incomplete thought process without saying, I'm willing to go up and down the stack. I'm willing to look at compiler bugs. I'm willing to look at the assembly the compiler produces. I'm willing to look at the, the kernel stack, the IP stack, the networking all around me. Those are critical parts to delivering part of the vision of what ATS is. So um, we're very fortunate in the ATS community that we have a whole bunch of people who run this shit and make money off of it and have to fix it. Um, so we have a very, very pragmatic group of people. Um, and I think that when you push the envelope like that, it's really important to have generalists involved in the community. So it's not so much pulling on all of the other communities here, but finding the generalists that use the product and really understanding their feedback. So your survival uh, depends on these projects that run at scale. Survival depends on recruiting generalists. Now, I'll have a caveat and say I think that really developer-focused tools don't have this issue. They don't operate at the same scale. They don't need to. That's not their purpose. Um, but I think the other option is to lever leverage the collective intelligence of the ASF for this. And this is probably the most important slide. When I wrote it, I looked at it and couldn't find a problem with it, which is pretty rare. My opinion is that the brain trust at the ASF is unparalleled in the software industry. There is no other community that has the diversity of brain power that the ASF has. We have, and it's not mainly because of the diversity of the different projects that we work on, the different languages, the different levels of the stack, from developer tools to production traffic service, right? All of that is very, very unique. We have so many different products. Um, and so many good people that produce them, we have a brain trust unlike any other. So the question that I hope that you guys can answer over the next two days is how to do that, because I don't have an answer to that. Um, but I, I feel like we are the people to solve that problem. You cannot collect a better group of people to solve that problem. And that's it. Sorry. Thanks very much, Theo. I presume you're prepared to take questions? I could. I may not have answers. Does anybody have a question? With regards to combating specialization and creating uh, tools to aid generalists, are there any technologies, ASF projects, or better yet, uh, problems that we could fall in love with that it would make you happy if you saw more energy dedicated towards? Um, that's an interesting question. I, I think that becoming a generalist is, is a rather personal mission. Um, and I think that from the very basic level, um, to never take the old school Windows IT admin approach to any problem, where it froze, so I'll reboot it, and it fixed it, so we're all good. Um, that idea of that acceptance of not understanding the root cause of a problem, the pathology of that failure, um, you don't always have the time to do that. You, you, you have a product schedule. But the idea that, I mean, I don't want to tell everybody to do everything at home all the time, but when I leave work and I solved a problem and I didn't understand the solution to it, I don't go to, I mean, I can't sleep like that. right? I have to understand why. Right, that question, that, that two-year-old, three-year-old question, why, 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 why? Like, you should be asking that, and you shouldn't really be satisfied with that answer. So we have the tools, like I said, I mean, literally the entire software stack is shit all the way down. So you have the tools right in front of you, right here, this thing never works, um, to, to have problems that you can explore, right? So every product that the ASF produce has bugs, uh, will have bugs, and every product it runs on does. So the problems are there. Um, and I do think that grabbing, it was one of the challenges with open source, is grabbing someone else's bug report is a lot less compelling than finding your own. Um, just because that question of why wasn't your question of why. Um, but, but figuring out how to bridge that gap is, is somewhat important. So really just not settling for an unanswered why. Coming across. Introducing myself, I'm Steve Hathaway. I'm, my primary employer is Oregon State Police, and I'm in charge of the data security and networking for uh, Oregon criminal justice and law enforcement access throughout the, uh, from Oregon throughout the entire uh, continent 
of North America and Canada. And in my employment, I'm, I'm also a committer for uh, Apache, uh, but that's not part of my employment. That's my avocation. I'm trying to find some answers to some big data problems and it enwrapped around some security problems of confidential information it, that can solve future issues that will be coming on my table in the near future. One of my data systems is about two terabytes worth of data logging and a basic index in SQL is about 270 gigabytes. I'm trying to find some architectures where I can refactor the data and put it into a different type of database and improve the search performance. If I do a, a basic crawl through the log files, it takes maybe two weeks worth of, worth of searching before I find an answer. If I do it through the SQL database, it takes maybe 12 to 20 minutes. I'd like to get the I'd like to be able to have the search be able to be done on a key database that I expect to grow to about 15 terabytes worth of index data with a response time of about 10 minutes. Are there any Apache uh, tools that, can, that I can use as a generalist to refactor a solution? Um, it's a very specific question. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, I, I would say that um, the confidentiality of your information is only a problem if it's a confidentiality of the problem you're trying to solve. Um, so uh, disclosing the architecture and the schema of, of the data you're storing as opposed to the actual data you're storing uh, would likely be enough information for any of the projects to understand how their solution would apply. Um, so two terabytes and 15 terabytes is is incredibly small change for, 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 for Hadoop. Um, it's also small for Cassandra. It really, I mean, that, that, that question, uh, you have to understand the, the scope and size of the data, the access patterns of it, and the questions you're trying to ask. And you need to understand that really well before you apply technology to it. So uh, recommending a specific technology without understanding that would be uh, uh, folly on my part. But, but I, would, I would take that information, not, obviously not the, the bad people or the good people, but the, the schema and the size of them and, and exactly the questions you're trying to answer um, and their latencies to, to like the Cassandra community and the Hadoop community. Because uh, if you touch both of those and they don't have an answer that says, not me, that person, or yeah, we can do that, then you, you're probably gonna run aground anyway. So. Thanks, Theo. Was there a question over here? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, the generalization, I think when you, you know, when you create an environment with the source code to all the layers of the stack and you have observability tools at different layers that are you know reasonably usable or approachable D-trace. right well yeah <laughs> i mean that's the kind of thing that that makes more people generalist yes. right uh and maybe you don't have the source code maybe you've got this weird jvm thing on solaris and you know it could be solaris 8 and solaris 8 has trust that will do freaking everything yeah. right you can start to solve, you know, you have your problem, right? But you can, you can get information that allows someone that knows the JVM to have something to chew on instead of just another user report, right? And if you have, you have the source code for your whole stack right there in your development environment, then you can take it a lot further, right? Yes. And if we can make, you know, on both sides, both the observability, right, and the easy access to source, um, good structure for that, uh, ways to navigate through it, find things, right? A lot of people, a lot more people are gonna be empowered to solve problems across the stack. Because even if you know you can do that, you know, conceptually, right, if, if there are all these barriers to finding out what's going on at every layer, right, and you're hitting yourself on the head every, every time you go through Right. another level then it's just not going to happen very often because you you know you've got to find another way to solve your problem yeah so so two two incredibly relevant comments on that are 
that the, one of the best ways to learn how to use those tools is that when you submit a bug report, ask the person who fixed it to walk you through the steps of remediation. So there's a lot of times where you submit somebody a core file and they just say, oh yeah, I fixed it. Right? Like, well, how did you read it? What were the commands that you used? What tools did you use? Why did you make those logical steps in, in, in diagnosing the problem? And now suddenly as a, as a Perl programmer or a Python programmer, you actually know a lot about debugging a CVM, right? So like the interpreter. Um, you start to learn by, by looking at that. And, and looking at a bug report and the patch is not relevant. I mean, like, unless you can repeat the process to get there and watch several processes like that, um, that's how you learn is to watch that process. It's like a mentorship in a lot of ways. And most people are, are once they've solved it, a lot of people are not really interested in doing that while they're trying to solve the problem because um, it's distracting. Um, but after they're done, they're usually pretty happy to go through and say, this is how I solve that problem. People like to talk about how they solve problems. Um, and then the other thing about, about observability, I'm a big, big fan of observability. I, t I talk a lot about monitoring and instrumentation and observability of products. And um, I, I think D-Trace is one of the best technologies that's been built in the last 20 years. Uh, pretty fantastic technology. It's, Oracle's bringing it to Linux as well, so it really runs on every OS uh, now. And uh, the interesting part that I found is once I had D-Trace, um, I did realize that it's much like an oracle. If you ask it a stupid question, you get an incredibly relevant and stupid answer. Um, so you have to be able to construct your questions well, and that requires understanding the whole stack and seeing the source code. So you need to be able to see source code for your drivers and your kernel and your application, um, which was the main killer for me for, for Oracle closing Open Solaris into Solaris 11, is that they just took the most powerful tool that has ever been created in the last 20 years for computing, in my, my opinion, and, and they neutered it for their own platform, which was like, what are you doing, right? So, but it, they're bringing it to Linux, and you have the source code to Linux, so you can really start to tailor incredibly intelligent questions to understand when your, when your product does X, Y, Z, how many minor fault hits do I get? How many page swaps do I get? When do I go to disk? How far does it seek? Like all sorts of really interesting cross-stack questions. Um, so it's a great tool for really exploring the world of applied computing. Okay, one at the back of the room, coming over, Jim. Uh, while I'm getting there, Theo, I wonder, do you, do you think that the open source community can continue to scale? Uh, I think it has a better chance than any other community. <laughs> so I'll punt on that question, but say if we're doomed, everyone else is. Yeah, my, my question was basically, I mean, don't you think that part of the problem had been that it had been kind of like impossible to be a generalist because you didn't have access to all the bits and pieces that allowed you to, to look at all the different layers? And as a corollary to that, is that a really good rationale for baselining open source at all layers because it allows you to be the generalist that you need to be? I think that having open source at every layer enables becoming a generalist much better than, than any other platform. You're always going to be stuck with some little bit, um, but it's, it's actually amazing to understand if you know the Linux kernel well and you understand how its subsystems work and you've trouble, you know, troubleshot some of the stuff that happens there, it's amazing how you can intuit how AIX works or HPOX. Um, so I think even if you're not running the open source, which I think if you can, and if it fits, you should definitely use it because the advantages are, are tremendous. Um, but even knowing the open source uh, counterpart to that, so understanding how Postgres works gives you an incredible amount of insight to how Oracle actually works, the Oracle database. So um, it, it's a database, right? It's built off the same academic papers, right? All, all of that stuff is there. So you actually see a manifestation of code. And like I said, it's. When you build code, you're just telling a computer what to do. So the C code may be different. It may be in a different language. But the, the data structures and the approaches and, and how it interacts with, with a computing platform are, are highly similar. Who's next? One problem I've found when I've tried to be a generalist is I can get out of my depth quite quickly, and then I really don't know what I'm doing. What advice would you give to people in the room who want to become more generalists about how to cope with getting out of their depth when trying out new things and moving outside their comfort zone? Uh, I think that's, that's a great question. Um, the, the specialist will never 
die. There will always be specialists. Even a lot of generalists actually have a specialization in one place or another. The best organizations that I see are a whole bunch of specialists that decided not to be specialists anymore. And it's, you, you can decide not to be, but you, you're still like awesome at that one thing, even though you're broad. Um, so if you have a company that has a lot of people, there is likely a specialist that can help you in that out of your depth moment. Um, and if not, there are specialists in every community in the ASF, there are specialists in that product. So if I'm out of my depth with Hadoop, there's no better place than the Hadoop community to go. Um, so there's a lot, especially in, in the ASF and other open source um, uh, organizations and projects, uh, it, I think it's, it's not difficult. It can be a little intimidating and it can be a little sprawling to try to collect all of those things, um, but they are there. It helps when you have a rapport with the people. So if you can do it within your own, or, your own organization, that's even better um, because then someone's going to come to you um, for the same thing and that sort of collaboration is really good. Okay, we've probably got time for one more question. Ah. No, well. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about. Um, okay, okay. For the for the re record, we talked a lot about being able to, when you're a general generalist, being able to find the resources of the specialist for that particular part. Um, a lot of this is available in open source because we're all in the open. We all have open mailing lists. But how do you ask the effective question to actually get the experts who you don't know in the Hadoop community to put thought and time into helping you out and answering you? So there's my other business. I actually sell magic eight balls. No, I, I, I don't have the answer to that. I, I mean, when you're out of your depth to the point where you can't formulate a question, um, it's probably better to formulate the problem statement. Um, so the problem statement, which is slightly different than the question. So I'm trying to solve this problem, and I've gotten to this point, and I'm, I'm just stuck. I don't even know the next question to ask. Um, because if you give someone enough context, then, then likely they'll be able to assist you to construct that, that more specific question. Maybe one more if anyone has a question. Otherwise, we can take our coffee break. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be uh, moving into individual tracks after the break. Uh, coffee's served next door. Um, if you need to know where anything is, it's all on this floor. Apart from lunch, we'll be going upstairs for lunch. Uh, if you need to any location, there's signs outside every room. Ask at the registration desk. Theo Schlossnagel, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.